Um, I think this class is also going to be like 30 minutes, very similar to the other class. Um, uh, but I wanted to walk through kind of like a bit of reminder what we did in the previous class itself. Um, so it's pretty clear. So, I mean, the major idea of what we're trying to do in the entire book, I think everybody's pretty aware now, is um, uh, visualizing your data, transforming your information and things like that. We are currently at the modeling stage. So like, how do you walk through an actual model itself? And, and the idea of this chapter is, like it says here, just literally model basics. And the way it tried to explain those model basics is using the idea of a linear model um, itself, right? So everything in this chapter is a lot more about linear models. Towards the end of the chapter, we kind of came to a point of um, how can you transform a non-linear model into a linear model itself? And you can walk through that. Um, we started off the chapter with establishing the goal of what a model is meant to be. And we explained that this is just to provide a simple summary of a particular data set. So if we can reduce what we think is happening in, in, in reality into like either a, a visual or a function itself, um, that, that gives us a best representation of what we should be looking for or what we should be trying to predict itself. And that, that's what a model tries to do, all right? It also says there are two parts to the model. So you have family of models. This tries to express a model in the idea of an equation or a function. Um, so an example is you know, the linear equation that is here with an intercept and a slope, with an intercept and a slope and a particular variable itself, right? Uh, then the other part of the model is when you're trying to generate a fitted model. So a fitted model in this case would be something close to reality as much as possible. Um, then the book kind of went into, you know, like how do you actually walk through this process itself? We use a tidyverse package and we specifically we use the model R package itself, right? And that takes us through this entire piece of work. And we ended up, I think, right about here, right? So where this part where we ended up, everything we did above this was just trying to explain um, the simple concepts around the model itself, right? Uh, without going into too much detail, just simple concepts. Model. What this tries to do is now to simplify that model into an actual equation. Then it walks through um, different kinds of variables that you're going to see. So categorical variables, categorical and continuous variables, or two continuous variables that you're going to be dealing with. Then um, um, at the bottom part of this chapter, we are going to talk about the interaction between variables itself, either categorical versus categorical versus continuous or continuous versus continuous. Then we are now going to talk about transformation. So how do you transform a nonlinear model itself? Cool. So let's kick off. So it says, um, you've, seen, you've seen formulas before when using facet wrap um, and facet grid in R. And the good thing is formulas provide a general way of getting a special behavior. Now, the idea of the special behavior is instead of evaluating the values of the variables that you have, so like instead of evaluating your X and Y immediately, you can actually capture them and interpret them by a function, which is like it's a, a condensed way of viewing your model, right? The, the majority of modeling functions in R use standard conventions from formulas to, to functions. And we've, we've seen um, one already at the beginning of this chapter. An example is, this y tilde x, right? And you can easily translate this into a simple linear model. So again, it has an intercept and it has a slope. Very simple idea of what a model can actually be. However, if you want to see what R is actually doing when it's transforming a, 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 from a formula to a function, you can actually use this model matrix function and we'll see how we walk through that, right? So let's, let's go to an example. I create an object called DF. I create it as a triple, right? And I create um, three major variables. So X, X1, and X2, right? If I want to see how this is actually functioning, I use the model matrix um, function, right? I run the objects I have created, this DF, and I do Y, y tilde um, X1, right? Uh, now, the interesting thing about this is, it does generate a prediction for X, so two and one, 
but it also adds its own intercept. And I think that's what is expressed here. The way R adds the intercepts to the model is just by having a colon that is full of ones, right? And you can easily drop this. If you don't want it, you can drop it by concluding this entire function here with minus one, which is what is done here. Right. So if I conclude it with, my, with minus one, I can easily just see only the predicted values and there are no more intercepts. Now, naturally, you might want to add a bit more variables to this, and it actually doesn't work in any unsurprising way. So model metrics goes in an unsurprising way when you add more variables to this. So similar to what we did up here, we can easily do the same thing here, just that now we are adding an extra variable, right? Um, so again, model metrics can help us see what's actually happening in that y tilde x1 and x2 in this, in this case, right? So again, since we did not end this, um, this code with negative one, you actually get an intercept, right? So it explains that this formula notation is sometimes called the Wim Christians Rogers notation, right? And is easily described in this document. Let me just post this link in the chat because I think it's actually an interesting document that, again, if you want to go into a bit more detail, um, it kind of expresses some of the thought process around moving from a formula to a function, right? And it's worth digging into reading up about the origin if you want to understand the full details of modeling algebra, right? Um, so the following sections will now talk about um, everything that we have spoken around here, moving from a moving to a function, using the variables that we have, adding new variables, so x1, x2. But now imagine a case where either these two variables are different. So let's say one is categorical, one is continuous, or they are both continuous. That's what the next stage now tries to go into. Right. So let's start with categorical variables. Right. So it says generating a function from a formula is straightforward when the predictor is continuous. I guess that's, that's pretty clear, but things become a bit more complicated when you have one of the predictors that is categorical. So imagine a case where in this, in let's use this as an example. So imagine a case where this DF object you have created, one of those colons is actually sex, right? And that, that's a categorical variable that you don't have a one or a two, an a numerical value for. Right? So it says, like it says here, imagine a case where you have a formula like Y tilde sex, where sex can be either, can either be male or female. It doesn't make sense to convert to a formula like what we had above, where Y is equals to, you know, two variables itself, um, like an intercept and a slope, because we don't actually have a numerical variable. So sex is not a number, you can't multiply it, especially because of the symbol here, right? And when we, get, when we get to later parts of this chapter, it kind of expresses what this symbol actually means and actually how we actually plays a role in the interaction between all the variables that we actually have here, right? So you can't do this work because we don't have a numerical variable, right? So instead, what does R do? So R would convert this non-numerical variable um, uh, into something like this, where, um, so if we express this, y equals to xo, x1, then expresses this. So it breaks out that sex itself into male and female, but it now calls sex male one if the sex is actually male and zero if it's actually otherwise. So at least now you can assign a numerical variable to it and you can use it to do like some proper modeling work. So I guess mathematically, if you're doing like, so in my case, for example, I work with a lot more uh, logistic regression in what I do. So credit scoring and logistic regression and things like that. And one of the major outputs that we have to do is um, you could have a customer that, because uh, I work a bit more in credit analytics. So if you have, you could have a customer that wants to take a loan, for example, and let's say the customer is uh, a, a male or a female, for example, and based on your historical data, you want to use the likelihood of default in that case. So what you kind of do here is what they're expressing here. So you can't use that male or female categorical variable, you have to convert it into a number. And one way I do it is actually uh, male is one, you know, female is, um, if, if the value is male, make it one. If the value is not male, make it a zero. So it's easier to work with here, right? So let, let's, let's work with an actual code to see what this actually represents. So again, we create the object, the, we run it through a table, 
we have our variable here, category variable, and we now have a response, right? So male is one, female is two, right? Then again, if you want to express what this looks like, uh, if you want to see its work in action, we can use the model matrix. The reason why, I think one of the reasons why I like this chapter, it's, 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 it's quite expressive. So it takes things a bit, it goes into a bit more detail of how, how you actually do this work. Now, a simplified way to actually do this is use what they call an LM function in R, right? Kind of gets this answer a lot, a lot easier. <laughs> it's a lot straightforward. But if you want to actually figure out what the LM function is actually doing, model matrix actually does work because it breaks things down for you to see how it actually works itself. So if I use model matrix, I run the objects I created, uh, then I try to get a prediction. So response to the X, um, um, to the sex um, on the X and Y variable, X and Y axis, you can easily now see it play out. So it's sex male, for example. So since we have called the second row to be female, you can see that the output here is zero because we have given an indication that if it's, if it's male, you give it one. If it's not male, you give it zero. Now, you might, you might wonder why R doesn't create a sex female colon, right? Um, and the problem here is it would create a colon that is perfectly predictable based on the other colons, right? So it will call sex male one minus sex, sex female one minus sex male, right? Which you know probably makes a bit more sense. Unfortunately, this is not the answer we're actually looking for because that could mean something quite different. Imagine a case where we assign a value of, uh, let's say two, so our sex male, right? So in this case, R will probably specify that sex female becomes negative one, which is not what we are looking for. That's why it's just a lot easier to work for us to work with the one and zero itself. So I said, unfortunately, the exact details of why this problem, why this is a problem is beyond the scope of this book, but basically it creates a model family that is way too flexible and would have infinitely many models that is equally close to the data which overfitting obviously is a problem in this kind of process that you're, that you're working with. Now, fortunately, if you want to avoid this particular headache that is flagged here, you can actually just visualize this entire work, right? Instead of going through trying to fine tune what sex female and sex male values are going to look like. So if we decide to, um, if we decide to visualize categorical variables, you can see that on the X axis, we have categor categorical variables A, B, C, D. And y axis, we have like a continuous variable. So we can use ggplot to kind of view what this looks like. We can now fit a model to this. So as now that we have visualized this, we kind of have expressions of where, where all the variables on x and y and, and what y where x is and you know what their corresponding y values are. Right. So now we can actually fit the model, which is in a case where you're trying to make it as close to reality as possible. So this is what I was trying to flag. You can actually do this a bit more if you don't want to use the model metrics. You can easily do this with the LM function, right? So I run, um, I create mode two uh, because we are going to work in with this object. If you want to create a grid, I create mode two. I run it through the LM function and I do Y tilde X and I run my data sim two, right? So this same data that we have visualized up here. Um, so one of the things is, since I want to represent as a grid, so it's easier to view, I now run this in two to kind of make it a grid itself. So I can see it show up in this kind of table. So in this case, you can easily see that, um, uh, I think I skipped a point. One point I think I skipped is this one. So this add predictions function, right? So essentially you're trying to generate a prediction for the categorical variables that you have represented, right? So when you represent it this way, you can see that now it has an actual prediction for what A should likely represent. Same thing with B, C, and D. Now you notice that a model with a categorical variable will predict the mean value of each category. So essentially, if I go back to this visualization, we can see if I use A as an example, we can you see that A has like eight, there are eight representations thereabouts. It would actually predict this as a mean value, which probably makes a bit more sense if you're trying to be conservative, right? So why, why does it do that? Because the mean minimizes the root mean squared distance. And I think one of the things that we talked about in the last, in the last class was 
this entire chapter was a bit friendly if you are aware of like linear regression, you know, ideas and concepts and things like that, right? So the mean minimizes the root mean squared um, distance. That's easy to see. If we actually overlay what we just did here in this actual visualization itself, which is what is represented in this. So let me run through the code of how this is generated. So I run ggplot, same as my, still my same two data sets, um, AESX. So I want to represent um, uh, it as a point. So geom point y equals y, geom point data equals to grid, which is the grid that we created here. Um, y is my predictive value, color it red and size is as four. So the four size is white, you know, the, the bubble is quite bigger than the other, other black bubbles itself and it's colored as red, right? So you can see now, since Y is represented as my predictive value, you can see it's kind of falls, you know, bang in the center itself. So it's representing the mean value of, you know, of, of what we actually predicted up here, right? Um, so you, you can't make predictions about levels that you don't observe. Sometimes you will do this by accident. So it's good to actually recognize this error message, right? So it, it just goes into extra details of what this represents. So table X is equals to E. So in this case, I mean, we don't actually have an E variable here, right? So it's quite useful that at least this function shows us there's an error here in this case. So it says error in the model frame report, terms new data, any action. Essentially what it just expresses is factor S R factor X as new level E, right? And you're just trying to call out an error here because we don't have an E, we only have A, B, C, and D, and that's what we have predicted, right? So this is just extra information um, that, that the, the chapter does tries to represent, right? So let's go into next step. So we've talked about two categorical, like a categorical variable, for example, let's go into continuous and categorical. So things become a bit more interesting here. Now we are working with a different data set. We're working with same three. What happens when you combine a continuous and a categorical variable, right? So the same three as a categorical predictor and a continuous predictor. And we can see that represented here. So you can see that um, X1 is a continuous value, that is at least it's a numerical value, and Y is also a numerical value. So things become a bit more interesting here. We can actually visualize this. Uh, we run the two axes we want to see, and we can actually color code them, right? So color code it by X2, right? So you can see each of my A, B, and Cs is now color coded itself. So now this is where things become a bit more interesting because there are two models you can actually use to fit this data compared to how we did this entire, entire work up here. Let me just go here, I think it's right here. So you notice when we're fitting this particular model, we literally just use one style, right? In this, there are two models that you can actually use here. The major difference between this and this is the symbol that you're using itself. And they actually mean two different things. So number one, I can create an object that is called mode one, running through the LM function, which like I explained is a simplified way of just doing this linear equation itself. But this first one has a plus sign with two continuous variables. This second one has a multiplication sign. Then I put my data in here, all right, that's in three. So it says, when you use the plus sign, the model will estimate each effect independent of others. So the effect of this and the effect of this would be um, estimated independent of itself. So X1 effect is going to be estimated independent of what X2 represents. If you use multiplication, there's now a case of interaction, right? So for example, if I use X1 multiplied by X2 is now translated into AO plus A1 multiplied by A1, plus A2 uh, multiplied by A2, plus A12 multiplied by A1 multiplied by A2. So there's just a bit more interaction that happens when we use this multiplication sign itself. So note that where, whenever you use that multiplication sign, both the interaction and the individual components are now included in the model itself, very similar to what we just saw here. So both the interaction, an example is this, and the individual components are now involved in the actual model itself. So the, to visualize this model, uh, we need two new tricks compared to everything that we have been doing before. 
I guess the first thing to note is we now have two predictors, right? So we need data grid. Uh, we need to give data grid both variables, right? It finds all unique values of X1 and X2 and generates all the combinations that we're actually looking for here, right? So that's the first thing, first trick that we need to use. The other thing is to generate the predictions itself. Um, we can use gather predictions, which it would add each prediction as a row, or we can use spread predictions, which would add each prediction as a new column. So in this case, we are using gather predictions here. So that's why each prediction is shown up as a row. So again, we have two models we're trying to walk through, mode one, mode two, and you notice that when we are trying to generate this, the prediction for, um, uh, for mode one, because we are using gather prediction, it's now represented as, as a row uh, in, in itself, right? So it's interesting, again, when we actually visualize this. We can visualize the results for both models on one plot using faceting, right? Um, so let's let's start with this. So ggplot sim three, the data sets we're using AES x1 y color by x2, make it a point, create a line that has this data grid and the predictive values, then facet wrap it by the actual model itself, right? Everything that we have created here, right? Now, this is quite interesting. You'll notice that the two models we created kind of behaved very differently. I guess this is also quite expected because they have two symbols. So one has an addition, one has um, a multiplication. You will notice that the one that has the addition, um, it has the same slope for each line or, and has different intercepts. And I think that's what is represented here, right? And the one that has the multiplication has different slopes. Um, and also different intercepts uh, for each line. Now, the obvious question here is, if we take a step back, all, all we have to work with here is literally just two continuous variables, right? So we've worked through trying to create two models, you know, itself, and things can get very confusing. So the question you now ask yourself is, so which model is actually better? So which one should I actually use? The one with the addition or the one with the multiplication, right? And one way to do it is we can actually take a look at residuals, right? So we faceted both model in the next picture here. We faceted by both model and X2 compared to how we did the facet wrap here, right? So again, in this case, we now faceted by X2 and the model itself, and this is kind of what it represents, right? Uh, because it makes it easier to see the pattern within each group itself. So this A, B, C, Ds that we are trying to see, very similar to what we are trying to do up here. I mean, this, this has some interpretative value. It's just difficult to drag it out. This is just a better code to work with, right? And I guess that's now the beauty of this facet wrap, <laughs> that, 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 you know, how it actually helps, right? So now I'm working with residuals itself, and I can actually see what each variable represents. So I broke out ABCD, and I facet wrap it by mode one and mode two, and also ABCD itself. Right. Now, the first thing we can see is there is little obvious pattern in residuals for mode two. So if we look at mode two, you see it's quite scattered compared to mode one, right? So mode one, even with B that might have some problems, there's some level of pattern itself. With C, there's some pattern. Um, D happens to be like a curve in itself. We can't see that kind of pattern in mode two, right? The residual for mode one, um, uh, shows that the model has clearly missed some pattern in B. Um, I guess that's represented by these actual spaces and, and the outliers that we have here. And less so, but present is pattern in C and D. So like what I was expressing, especially D, D has a very nice curve attached to it, right? Um, you might also wonder if there's a precise way of telling if mode one or mode two is better, if we don't want to use residuals, and I guess the answer there is yes, but everything we are focusing on this book is just the qualitative assessment. So if you want to actually figure out if mode one or mode two is great, um, um, you could actually use a bit more mathematical work, a bit more quantitative work. And what we're just working through here is just qualitative assessments, just to figure out which one has a pattern that we are largely interested in. So this covers a categorical variable and a continuous variable. The, the third bit is now, if we have two continuous, and I guess 
you would have noticed that we faced some level of interactions when we are walking through a categorical variable and continuous variable itself. And in this case, it becomes a bit more interesting. So if we look at an equivalent model for two continuous variables, initially things proceed identically to the previous example, very similar. In this case, we also decided to represent two models because of the two symbols here, an addition and the multiplication. We are now working with SIM4 because SIM4 now has um, two continuous variables that is working through it itself. But we kind of went through an extra step of doing um, sequence range. And I guess I would explain what this actually represents itself, right? So the code does one model LM function Y tilde X1, X2, our two continuous variables. The data here is SIM4. The second object is mod two, running through the LM function uh, Y tilde X1. Um, and the same data set as in four. We create a grid because we want to represent it in this format. Same four, we pipe it through data grid itself. X1, we are trying to create a range between X1 and five. X2, we are trying to create a range between X2 and five. Now we also gather predictions because we wanted to represent those predictions in a row format. So it says, notice the use of sequence range inside the data grid. Instead of using every unique value of X, uh, we, we, are going to, we are going to use a regularly spaced grid of five values between the minimum and the maximum numbers, right? And I think when we visualize this, it becomes a bit more interesting to see. It's probably not super important here, but it's a, just a useful technique in general, just to have a bit more condensed data sets because X1 and X2 could mean quite a lot. It could have like very wide sets of information that's there. So we're just trying to limit it to a five, just five data set at a time itself, that's the idea of what this sequence range tries to represent, right? Um, so it says there are a number of arguments that sequence range has, and I'll probably just run through this because I think this is also extra information itself, right? So an example is extra argument here is pretty. So pretty equals true will generate a very pretty sequence, something that looks nice to the human eye. This is useful if you want to produce a table of outputs. So if you want to, maybe you want to share the report externally, for example, when we are walking through the sequence range that we have here, we can actually create an extra argument here using pretty equals true, right? So an example is this, right? Uh, you notice that if I do this without the pretty equals true, you notice that it has a number of decimal points. If I use pretty equals true, it's kind of a bit more nicer to see because you're just using just one decimal unit. So that's, that's just like, you just want to clean up the information itself. Second argument that's attached to sequencing range is trim. So in this case, trim equals to 0 0.1. What this will do is, um, and I guess this comes up when you are doing data cleanup in like a modeling process itself. If you want to trim off 10% of the tail values, right? This is quite useful if the variable you're working with has a long tail distribution. That can be useful, but you, you feel um, for the quick and dirty work that you're trying to do, that long tail distribution is going to skew your analysis. So in this case, you can actually continue this sequencing range and add trim. Trim equals 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, just specifying the percentage of data that you wanted to kind of spin off from, from what you want to analyze. So an example is like a Cauchy distribution itself. You notice that I'm trying to trim off 10% of it. Um, you know, everything that I have here, it just kind of trims off everything that makes things a bit more shorter and a bit more nicer. I can do 25%, I can also do 50%, right? Depending on how, how crazy you want to you know, streamline your information itself, right? I usually don't advise this uh, because I mean, there's a lot of lost interpretive value that you probably end up losing out here. It's like doing an average, for example. There's a lot of lost information that you would have if you actually use this process itself. Well, I, I guess it also depends on the kind of work um, that, 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 that one works through. The third argument here is expand. So this is literally just an opposite of trim, right? So if you want to expand the range of information you're looking at here by an extra 10%, you can use expand equals 0 0.1, right? So also imagine a case where I run an information. Um, I just create a simple object, 0 and 1. Um, I'm sequencing range in this thing because I just wanted to select just five variables. And I now want to expand it by an extra 10%. Um, you notice that it gives me a bit more information itself compared to what I actually have up here, right? So it expands and if it goes to the negative itself. And if I want to further stretch that negative, I can just include 
keep increasing that expand by itself. So all everything I described up here is just extra information. So we again we are working with just two continuous information. Uh, we are trying to see what that interaction looks like. We created two different models because they have two different symbols, right? So now let's now go to the midst of the of the you know process itself. Hey, are you me? <laughs> um, so so one one way to go into the information is let's try to visualize this, right? So. I'm not a big fan of this kind of plots because for me it's quite difficult to actually pull out. You know, I'm not a very good color color person itself. So this this information is very difficult. But I'll just run through the code itself. So ggplot grid aes are uh, two continuous variables. It creates as geom tile, um, and you fill with the prediction itself and facet wrap by the model. So like if you want to, you know, use the predictive value itself. So this 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 looks quite different. It might be difficult. I don't know if I can zoom in. It might be difficult to actually see the actual difference between mode one and mode two itself, especially around this bottom, this bottom half itself. So this suggests that the models are very different. Uh, this doesn't suggest rather that the models are very different. Like I said, the lighting is not that bright itself for you to know what's going on. Um, and you can do this in a in a bit more, you know, a bit more better way, which is very similar to what we did. When we're walking through the categorical variable and the continuous variable. So literally just represent it by, by lines. And uh, we can now create our own facet wrap using X2. Right. So let me just run through the explanation that it has here. So what this shows you is, let me try to do this. What it shows you is it's an interaction between the interaction between the two continuous variables works basically the same way as interaction between the categorical variables. So the way I expressed it. If you're working with the plus sign, uh, let me see if I can go back to the equation. I can't find the equation now. Working with the plus sign, it's it's kind of interprets each each effect of each variable independently of itself. If working with multiplication sign, it kind of bakes in some level of interaction between all the variables that you have in that particular equation itself. So it literally works the same way as it works for a categorical and continuous variable, right? The interaction says that there isn't any fixed offsets. You need to consider both values of x1, x2 simultaneously if you actually want to predict what y looks like, right? And you can see that even with two continuous variables, coming up with a with visualization is quite hard, but it's reasonable. You shouldn't expect that it's easy to understand when you start going to three or more variables um, uh, and when they are simultaneously interacting. I still prefer the process of visualizing though, because I think. It, it's, it gives me, instead of just going from a formula to a function immediately, kind of gives you a bit more interpretative value itself. And I think one of the things that the book is trying to teach in general is um, just for, for, at least for me, particularly to kind of have like a stepwise process when I'm doing some modeling itself. So visualization does, you know, I think I'm beginning to understand, it does play a big role instead of just joining, instead of just jumping to predict the actual value itself. So even if things become a bit more cumbersome, as you are going, like you're adding a bit more variables, it's probably a lot more advisable to visualize the information because that gives a bit more information, right? But again, we are saved, we are saved a little time because we are using models for exploration. You can gradually build up your model over time. Model doesn't have to be perfect. It just has to reveal a little more about your data, right? Um, this part is a bit more information. Um, I spent some time looking at the residuals to see if I could figure out if mode two did better than mode one. Um, I think it does, but it's pretty sort so you kind of have to walk through it and the exercise itself, right? Uh, so I think this is second to the last part. I think we're still at right on time. Second to the last part of the chapter itself, so transformation. So now we've talked about um, um, uh, a model in general, moving from a model, from a formula to a function. Within a function itself, you can actually have two variables, two or more variables. As soon as you're having two or more variables, interactions play a role, especially when the, the function that you have has a multiplication sign. The third part is now transformation. So imagine a case where you now have a non-linear model. An example is you're working with logs, you're working with square roots. And let's say you're working with like a raised to a power, for example, right? And you want to transform this into a linear equation. So y equals a1. Uh, the intercept and the slope and, and you know, uh, a simple variable. So x1 is square root of x, 
and A3, you know, and X2, right? So he also says, if your transformation, so if your nonlinear equation or the transformation you want to do on your nonlinear equation includes or involves addition, multiplication, a carrot sign of negative, you need to wrap it within this particular function itself, I in brackets. So that's R doesn't treat it as part of the model specification itself. I'll, I'll forgo all this part so I can explain it in an actual code uh, itself, right? Again, if you're confused about what your model is doing, similar to how I explained earlier, you can just use your model metrics to kind of break it out for you if you want to see what the model is actually doing. Um, or you can just simplify it by using LM function uh, itself. So let's walk through this step by step. So we create a DF object um, running through a table. We have three different um, um, fields here, one, two, three, both for X and Y. We wanted to see what's actually going on in our model. So we use model matrix. We run it through this. Since we did not use a negative one, it will give us an intercept. But you notice that it is now um, including, it's not interpreting this correctly. And that's why it wants us to put it within this I bracket function. Right. So now if I put it within, I, is within this I bracket function, it is now treated as its own coefficient in itself, right? So I still have my intercept because I'm not ending this model matrix with the negative one. But now I have two variables, which is what I was aiming for here. I have my x raised to power two, and now I have my x, and now I have predictive values for, for them, right? So again, this part just goes into an extra information. Transformation is useful because you can use them to approximate nonlinear functions. Use the calculus class, you can have the Taylor theorem and you know, and all those nice things uh, itself. Um, I guess this part is quite important. So let, let me just take a step back here. So I said, if, you, if you've taken a calculus class, you may have heard of the Taylor theorem, which says you can actually approximate any smooth function with an infinite sum of polynomials itself. Um, so I think it's like matrix algebra and things like that. So this, this means, you can use the linear function to get arbitrarily close to a smooth function by fitting an equation, right? So let's assume this equation itself. Now, obviously this, this has a lot of expression attached to it, especially if I keep having a bit more variables. So typing this by R is quite tedious. I can just simplify this using what we have a poly function in R, right? So I can use my model metrics because I want to see what's going on. Same DF object, I run my Y through a poly function itself, so X and two, right? And you can see they're a bit more, a bit more expressive um, here, right? However, there's, there's one major problem with using a poly function. Outside the range of data, polynomials rapidly shoot off to positive or negative infinity. One safe alternative is to use natural spline. I think it also depends on the data set that you're using and exactly what you're, what you're also aiming for. Right, so the advice here is instead of using poly, if you just use splines, so we, we, we run library splines, then we use exactly the same work, very similar to what we did up here. So instead of this y tilde poly x and two, we now use y tilde ns, which is coming from the splines package uh, itself. All right, um, so if I decide to do this entire work running as a non-linear function, and I want to visualize this, this is currently what it looks like. Right, so sin five, and this entire information here kind of looks like this, right? And we're going to try to fit five different models to this information, right? Again, using that splines package uh, uh, in itself, right? So mod one LM, um, essentially the major difference is just one, two, three, four, five here, right? Run it through a grid um, so we can see what this full picture represents. Let me just run this ggplot formula. So like this, whatever data set I have, my sim five, trying to create an X and Y axis here. I want to see what the approximation of this nonlinear curve kind of looks like. And, you can, and I want it to be represented as red uh, itself. Right. Um, and again, we have, I have explained the idea of this gather prediction. So I want to predict um, uh, what mode one, two, three, four, five that I've created here looks like. Right, now you notice that the more we go ahead, the, there's a kind of interesting case of like an overfitting itself, right? It's being a bit more, a bit more, um, um, uh, it's, it's, not, it's not being as, as well cut out as we kind of want it to. So, so that's why it expresses here that 
notice that extrapolation outside the range of data is clearly bad, right? This is the downside with approximating a function using a polynomial. And I think we had used it up here somewhere, all right? Um, uh, but this is a very real problem with every model. So the model can never tell you if the behavior is true when you start extrapolating outside the range of the data set itself that you have seen, you must rely on theory and science. So in this case, like I said, obviously depends on your data sets uh, that you are, you are currently walking through. That would represent if this extrapolation that is trying to flag up here is an actual problem or not. So if this extrapolation is a problem or not. So the final part of this chapter now talks about missing values. So everything we have been assuming so far is you have a data set that has all the variables complete. Uh, but what happens in a case where we actually have missing values? So I think this chapter is, is part of the, of the chapter is a bit more straightforward. So he said, missing values obviously cannot convey any information about relationship between variables, especially because we have the cases of interaction and transformation here. So if you have missing values, obviously it distorts what our data set is going to represent. Um, so modeling functions will drop any row that has missing values. Now, our default behavior is to silently drop them without any kind of uh, warning or, you know, it's up. I guess that would probably be a problem if you're using a very large data set and you can't go through each of the rows itself. So one of the things that you can do is when you're creating your, your code, you can actually end the code with options, any action equals any one. Um, and I think an example is, is here. So again, I create my DF object running through a table. I get this information here. Um, and I intentionally I've created the information with uh, missing values. So if I try to run this, you know, it shows me um, mod LM y, y x, y to the x, so regress y equals to x. Uh, my data is DF literally here. It shows me a warning. So dropping two rows with missing values, right? So these two rows. Right. If I want to suppress this one, in, um, I can just use any action equals any exclude. Right. Right. Um, so it just shows me what the information set is. Um, and you can actually see um, how many observations were used using knobs. Right. So if I run knobs through the mode object I just created, it kind of shows me uh, three. Right. Uh, right, so the final bit here is just going to all that information. I, I won't dwell on this itself, but what this is trying to express is everything that we've done in this chapter is a lot more about linear models and there, there are a lot of other kind of models itself. So there's a large set of model classes that extends uh, the linear model in various interesting ways. An example is generalized model. I won't go into this because I think it's just a bit more quantitative it's outside the context, context of the book itself. Right, so generalized linear models, generalized additive models, parallelized linear models, robust linear models, and trees. Right, so these models all work similarly from a pers programming perspective. Once you have mastered linear models, you will find it easy to master the mechanics of other model classes. And I think as we're now going to the next chapters itself, we start working with a bit more um, non-linear non equation. Right, so being a skilled modeler um, requires a good mixture of general principles everything we've walked through here and a big toolbox of techniques, literally this entire information that we've walked through here. So from the idea that all the model is trying to do is approximate what your data set represents, um, um, reducing that data set itself to what a, a function is, um, visualizing that function, um, having the, the toolbox to work if the variables within your data set is you know, categorical or continuous or is both, and knowing exactly what to do, especially because interactions kind of play a role. Then finally ending up with, in a case where I don't have the linear information, um, what do I do if I want to transform uh, itself, right? So, I, I mean, I'll briefly walk through this next chapter, just the introduction part, um, nothing complex at all. Um, and I'll probably end the class in the next two minutes, right? So in the previous chapter, we learned about linear models. Um, we learned about some basic tools for understanding what a model is telling you. Um, uh, this chapter itself is going to focus on linear, on, on real data itself, because we'll be using like simulated information. We have been creating our own tables, tribbles, and things like that. But now we are going to be working with like real data itself. Now showing you how you can actually build up a model to aid the understanding of the data itself, right? So we can take advantage of the model partitioning that we, that we learned about in the previous chapter. So the patterns and the residuals that we learned about, 
we can actually understand these patterns a bit more visualization, something that we learned again in the previous chapter. We can repeat the process, replace the old response with residuals on the model, essentially using everything that we learned in the previous chapter itself. And understanding that for large uh, complex data sets, this would be a lot of work. And there are alternative approaches that, that we need to, we need to um, work through. I think that alternative approaches is what we now start learning in this um, model building stage uh, itself. So I guess in the next class, we'll probably kick off from this part. So let me just put a note here. Uh, in the next class, we'll continue from this part. Um, but I hope everything I've been able to describe so far uh, makes a lot of sense. Um, uh, Mr. D, I mean, I think we had, we kind of had like a thought process we wanted to walk through. Let me see how I can. Hmm. Perfect. So, so myself and Mary were actually discussing um, an idea around not slowing down the class itself. Uh, one of the things that I did is I kind of realized that the model chapters that we have are quite long, so they probably need to be split into two. Um, and I decided to take myself off um, some of the chapters in case I'm not around, so the, the meeting can actually move on. I think Maria had already given an indication that she's likely going to be missing this class itself. Am I correct? Exactly. So, so you know, myself and Mr. Adem will try to make ourselves available. But Mr. Adem, I mean, if you have any idea of either any of these bits that you'd like to take, I mean, please feel free to put your name down here so that I don't delay the class in case I haven't read the chapter and I don't feel confident yet to, to go through it on the call. So I think that's why I want to end um, this meeting today. Thank you, Daniel, and thank you for organizing us. Hopefully, we will finish this book soon. No problem. No problem. All the best, guys. Cheers. See you next time. Thank you. Cheers. See you next time, guys. Bye.